Um, so uh, this presentation is going to be um, more empirical. So I'm going to talk about our case studies and their narratives of change. So uh, I'm presenting a working paper that has been led by Julia Wittmeyer and that we have so far written with a core writing team, uh, including Julia Backhaus and Bono Pell, Tim Strasser, who isn't here, and myself. And we will be involving other people uh, later on, but this is the start. So there is a draft paper. If you want to read it, please let me know. I can send it to you. Um, so what we have done, we have looked very closely at the topic of this pressure cooker, which is about theories of change. And we, we wanted to, to talk about what are the theories of change of the networks that we studied, of the, the social innovators themselves. What are their near theories of change? And to approach this question, we use the concept of narrative. So the way they tell stories about how change comes about is how we approach their theories of change. So narratives of change is a concept that we use to conceptualize sets of ideas, concepts, metaphors, discourses, and storylines about change and innovation. And these reveal these theories of change about why the world has to change, who has the power to do so, and how this can be done. And um, what we have done in this paper is a bit of a literature review about all the narrative research that is out there, which is a lot. It's a very broad interdisciplinary field um, that also includes really classical, almost linguistic content analysis, yeah? like how our sentences structured and that kind of stuff. But we focus on the social construction of narratives. So how people in the social context construct narratives. That's our focus. Um, and I'm, I don't have time to go into this literature review. You can find that in the paper. What we did, we developed a little framework based on that literature review to study our case studies in terms of their narratives. And the framework consists of three parts. First, the content of the narrative. So what's the narrative about? What does the narrative say? Second, the social production of narratives. So how are these narratives produced? And third, what is the underlying assumption about the role of narratives in enabling change? And the most important dimension so far is the first one, the content of narratives, where we distinguish three dimensions, which is the context. So what does the narrative say about the social context and why things have to change? The second is about what does the narrative say about the actors? Who supposedly enables change? And the third is the plot. And here we put a lot of things that maybe we should unpack a little bit more. That's for the future research. So how does change come about when and where? So earlier I showed you this overview of the cases we have done so far. 12 transnational networks that are working on social innovation and many of them having transformative ambitions. And for each of these networks we looked at the, the global networking and we also looked at local manifestations. Now, it has to be emphasized that, obviously, these local manifestations are very specific to their local context. Yeah? So the eco-village that we studied in Portugal, Tamira, is completely different from the eco-village that we study in German, Sieben Linden. So we're not looking at the local narratives. What we tried to do was look at the meta-narrative, or the master narrative, as we call it in the paper, at the network level. Because even though there's many differences between these local manifestations, there is a kind of a meta-narrative at the network level. Uh, so to, we, in the paper, we discuss a few, we zoom in on a few case studies and see what their narratives are. And we use the framework that I just presented to analyze it. So the first of them is RIPES, which is a network, the intercontinental network for the promotion of social economy and solidarity economy. Another case study, which in the paper we look at Ashoka, but in this presentation I will be focusing on the impact hub because I studied it myself and I feel more comfortable presenting it. And they're very similar because both of them are networks of social entrepreneurs. So, yeah, so the focus is on social entrepreneurs. Then you have the Transitions Town Network, which many of you know, and the Global Eco-Village Network. So as you can see, these are very different things, yeah? ranging from a political movement to a co-working space of a uh, network of entrepreneurs to people living in communities with their families. So these are very different animals. Um, just to give you an impression, these are, you know, the, the Impact Hub, for instance, is a network that has 63 different co-working spaces across the world. 
11,000 members and 20 impact hubs in the making. Just to give you a bit of an impression, because we often look at these things as, you know, cute little grassroots things, but actually if you look at their global networks, they, ha they are more substantial than a lot of people associate them with. The same applies to the global eco-village network. You know, it's one of the most radical grassroots things that a lot of people can think of, you know, eco-villages that like live in their uh, eco-communities, uh, but they have this really substantial global network that then has all these different regional networks, and they really have a strong common story, even though they're very different on the ground. So this is the framework, which I'm not going to go into details. So for each of the dimensions, we have a few questions that we ask. So to start with the context, why change? If you look at the, 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 the examples that I just introduced, if you look at the Impact Hub and Ashoka, you see that they see the problem of the world in terms of that everything is organized as centralized, formalized, rigid structures, and that there is this... Um, Perfect. There is a distinction between for-profit versus non-profit. So the Impact Hub really um, focuses on the need to have this social entrepreneurship that bridges non-profit and for-profit. They really believe that these things can go together. And they also really believe in independent entrepreneurs. So they really believe that it's possible to empower people to kind of get out of these rigid bureaucratic structures and become independent entrepreneurs. Well, if you look at the global eco-village network and also transition towns, the problem they see is of a bit of a different nature. They focus on there being individualization, disconnection, fragmentation. So if you look at the solution that they propose, it's much more about living in community, about reconnecting, uh, about ho holistic approaches. And then if you look at uh, a network like RIPES, the problem that they would emphasize is globalization, capitalism, the hegemonic neoliberal order, these kind of topics. And they emphasize the need for more equality and more solidarity economy. So as you can see, the way they, they frame the context of why change is needed is quite different. And then you also see that what we call game changers, these kind of macro developments like peak oil, climate change, the economic crisis, you also see very clearly that the networks that we study respond to those. So the Transition Towns movement is a very good example that started in response to the peak oil and then it reframed itself to be about climate change. And then when the economic crisis hit in 2008, it also really uh, played into that as being a, a solution for local economies. Actors, who enables change? In the case of Impact Hub and, social, uh, and Ashoka, you see a very clear focus on social entrepreneurs and also intrapreneurs. So it's about entrepreneurial people, whether they're independent or whether they're in organizations, but it's individual entrepreneurial people who can become change makers and impact makers. Yeah, if you, this is a wall of one of the Impact Hubs where the members are framed as impact makers. And they are, it's a community of impact makers for a radically better world. So there's a lot of emphasis on the individual. Uh, if you look at the global eco-village network, you see that there is a very different focus in terms of who enables change, which are the community members. Thank you. The communities, residents, parents, planetary citizens, or spiritual be beings. Uh, so the focus is also very much on children growing up and becoming different kind of planetary citizens. And there's also a lot of attention for being a spiritual being that is in connection to nature. So as you can see, completely different from the Impact Hub. Um, if you look at RIPES, and here I will ask Bono later maybe to nuance it a little, it's much more about political collectives and empowered citizens. So it's much more about political animals. And so also if you look at the website, you see like much more like, the, the, yeah, I don't know how to just express, but you see like two kind of things. You see like common citizens as well as people in suits at tables discussing. So it's a very different image of who will enable change. It's about, you know, political action and about coming up for your rights and solidarity. So it's a different kind of story. So coming to the plot, change how, when and where. In the case of the Impact Hub, the focus is very much about creating ecosystems where innovation can thrive, creating co-working spaces where entrepreneurs can come together and empower themselves and each other, and it's very much about improving skills, providing 
these individuals with the skills they need to become impact makers. Yeah, so if you also see here, this is their slogan. They want to create vibrant communities, inspiring spaces, and meaningful content to these entrepreneurs. And it's very much about work. Yeah, so there is also all these like work benches, as they call it, where entrepreneurs go and learn how to increase their impact. Uh, if you look at the Global Eco Village Network, it's much more about be the change that you want to be. So that's their theory of change. It's very much about you have to start with yourself. And it's also they have this metaphor of acupuncture points. Um, about living, uh, you have to start living in community and that's when the world changes. If you start to relearn to connect with each other and living in community. And it's also very much about children growing up in a different context. So that's when also the place and the, the time that they think change will come about. So they also have this very, uh, the metaphor of the, the butterfly, if nothing ever changed, there would be no butterfly. So they really believe in starting really small. And they have this holistic approach where they really try to combine social, cultural, ecological and economic things, where the cultural is also this strong attention for spiritual matters. And then last but not least, RIPES is much more about empowering collectives, about a political voice, and it's much more about the public and the political arena as a place where change and also maybe intellectual and scientific debate is much more a focus of how they go for change. So if you go to their website, there's a lot about forums and world meetings and conferences and, uh, and really the political discourse. Um, so coming to the end, um, if you look, as you see, there's many, different, there's many differences between these um, uh, cases. But what they have in common is, first of all, that they're very locally active and globally connected, and that they all pay considerable attention to the production of these translocal narratives. So all of them have a very strong local narrative, but they also share this strong global narrative. And they all are particularly aware of the role of narratives. I was struck by that, that they all, all emphasize the need to create a new narrative. Like the impact hub has this old, like it really is very sensitive to how it uses words and images. It's very <coughs> preoccupied with that. And also like the Eco Village Network, for instance, organized this new story summit where they actually also say, as we change our story, we change our world. If we do not create a positive, realistic picture of the future, we will not live in it. Um, so you clearly see that all networks um, yeah, have a strong attention to the role of narratives. So my last slide, and then I'll really stop. Uh, the so what question. Yesterday we discussed a lot about structure and agency, or that's what we ended with, with this big... And you see in the narrative very clearly that both structure and agency are really manifested there. Uh, so what, what does this mean to do this? Is that, first of all, the importance to become aware of the structural power of narratives. And to also look about, because we only focus on the narratives of our case studies, but there are also, of course, policy narratives, and to look at the power dynamics between these two. And then there's, of course, the question, and this is more a question than a conclusion, can we increase the transformative potential of these narratives by creating narrative agency, or can we improve narrative skills? Is that something that, you know, is a useful thing to do? And last but not least, I think for researchers, one of the main challenges is not only to deconstruct narratives, I think that's very important, but also to see if we can help reconstruct them in a way that is productive and maybe have narrative experimentation that we try out different narratives. And now I'm really going to stop. Sorry for going over time. It seems to be... <laughs> I'm usually quite on time, so I don't know what happened. Sorry. <laughs> it's time for questions now. Yes? Can Hola. Say, can you say your name? Yes, of course. Yes. I'm Gilles from the University of, Faculty of Science, University of Lisbon. Uh, thank you for the great presentation. Also, just to thank you also for, for, for inviting me to be here. Um, one question. Also, all these uh, initiatives and networks, it seems that they're also started by themselves individually, but they also connect a lot with themselves. I mean, you might have a transition network, people going to permaculture, uh, well, started from permaculture, but also some of them living in eco villages, mm -hmm. and then it inspires through a course somebody that creates a, a co workplace. How do you see these also linkages? Or do you, you study, do you, you perceive somehow how they communicate and influence each other through narratives and experimentation? Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, the concept of meta-narrative can also be useful to kind of see clusters. And we start to see that already. You already saw that I put eco-villages and transition towns together. And this is like really emerges from the empirical data that we see clusters. And at the transitions conference two weeks ago, we also presented a paper on new economies. And we actually saw four clusters of new economy thinking where we could really cluster the different networks that you really see that the impact hub and Ashoka are really diff quite different than, for instance, eco-villages and transition towns. And eco is, of course, a place. So we should also look at the networks of networks. But yeah, this was already quite a step from not looking at the local to the networks. And then, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for a nice presentation. That was really interesting. Uh, my question would be, uh, did you come across any tensions uh, within those networks? I mean, creating new narrative means that more or less a lot of people have to stand behind that. And as we have learned from our transition studies, uh, there's really a heterogeneous group. And the more they grow and you have shown that they are really worldwide network, I wonder if they all uh, really follow the same narrative or what are the tensions there. As I understood, you did not really study that, but maybe you came across them. Yes. Uh, so we did study that because we really looked about how the network started and how it grew and how it emerged. And then we also looked at the local initiatives and how they perceived this network. So their tensions with this global network really came out. So to just give two examples, the impact hub. In the Netherlands, they talk a lot about the social impact e economy. And I was writing that down. The impact hub is about social impact economy. They were like, no, 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 because our eastern partners don't like that word. So at the global level, we wouldn't use that. Then they have these common values, courage, trust, collaboration. Those are the three things that globally everybody agrees with. But then locally, they use different terms. And at the eco-villages, you have the famous example of Tamira, which is mostly a German eco-village in Portugal, which has this philosophy of free love. And at the global eco-village network, this is not at all considered to be a common thing. I mean, yeah, no, not at all. So <laughs> there are more eco-villages that have that philosophy, but it's, it's also kind of a cliche of eco-villages that a lot of eco-villages don't want to be associated with. So, it, but it's something that Tamira has very strongly. So there are different, and there, there were some tensions between the global eco-village network and Tamira about that. And they figured it out, and it's beautiful to see how they, they find their common points and then agree to disagree. Yeah. Thank you, Flor. Okay. Uh, thank you very thank much. You.